Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I want to welcome you to today's event, which is part of our West Coast initiative, and which certainly ventures far from my zone of comfort to discuss automobiles and the convergence of safety, cybersecurity, and privacy risks with Andrew Grotto of Stanford University. Uh, Andy Grotto is currently the founding director of the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance at Stanford. He's also a William J. Perry International Security Fellow at the Cyber Policy Center and a Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution, both at Stanford. So tonight, or today, I should say, depending on where you are, Andy will take us deep into the uncharted territory of the Internet of Things and look at the challenges it presents for global businesses and governments in terms of interweaving of the risks related to safety, cybersecurity, and, and privacy. And having read some of Andy's work on these issues, I confess that my original instinct was to turn around and march straight into the past and avoid what seems to me to be a layer cake of incredibly uh, difficult problems with all manner of infrastructure, consumer goods, and even that most familiar of possessions, the automobile, as it evolves into a self-driving, highly computerized vehicle unlike anything we've seen before. Andy Grotto is certainly the right person to give this talk. Before coming to Stanford, he served as the Senior Director for Cybersecurity Policy at the White House in both the Obama and Trump administrations. He has been a Senior Advisor for Technology Policy to Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker, and he worked on Capitol Hill as a member of the professional staff of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He served as Chairman Dianne Feinstein's lead staff overseeing, overseeing cyber-related activities of the intelligence community and all aspects of the National Security Agency's mission. He led the negotiation and drafting of the information sharing section of the Cybersecurity Act of 2012, which later served as the foundation for the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act that President Obama signed in 2015. He also served as committee designee first for Senator Whitehouse and later for Senator Conrad, advising the senators on the oversight of the intelligence community including covert action programs. And he was a contributing author of uh, the very well-known committee's study of the Central Intelligence Agency's detention and interrogation program. And his research interests center on national security and the international economic dimensions of American leadership in, the information tech, in information technology innovation and its growing reliance on this innovation for its economic and social life. His commentary has been published by CNN, Foreign Policy, uh, The New American, Lawfare, and War on the Rocks, among others. Andy Grotto holds a uh, law degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's in public administration from Harvard, and a BA from the University of Kentucky. Um, Andy, I'm very much looking forward to the talk, but let me just first give a roadmap, appropriately enough, for tonight's talk. Uh, Andy will speak for about a half an hour, uh, and he has some slides to present. After that, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, uh, let me just say that you can start putting uh, questions into the Q&A queue just as soon as you want to, uh, starting right now. Um, obviously, uh, Andy's picked the automobile as a, uh, as a symbolic case of uh, what we're getting into with the uh, Internet of Things and the computerization or digitalization of everyday life. So feel free to uh, range beyond the uh, uh, issue at hand with automobiles, uh, and we can talk about regulation, international cooperation on these events, and many other things. Um, do not uh, raise your hand. Uh, no one can see you raise your hand on the, uh, on the Zoom screen. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Andy. The virtual podium is yours. Great. Thanks, Dan. And, and thanks, everyone, for uh, joining uh, this afternoon or morning or wherever the time is um, where you're sitting. So um, I want to start with a puzzle. Uh, and the puzzle is why are zero days and exploits so cheap? A zero day vulnerability is a vulnerability that, that hasn't been discovered yet in, um, in software. Uh, it's called a zero day because no days have passed since it's uh, disclosed to the wider world. Uh, zero days are coveted by um, adversaries because, um, it, by definition, if 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 if, the, if there's a vulnerability that isn't known beyond the individual who discovered it, there's no mitigation for it, and so it allows uh, attackers 
if they can develop an exploit for it um, to um, to take advantage of a system um, and uh, avoid uh, getting kicked out uh, because there's no patch yet until uh, unless and until the uh, the uh, the zero day is discovered. Um, it turns out that you know, it, it, and I've got you know a line here from from a really good study on on the black market, uh, the marketplace for for zero days um, and and their accompanying exploits. Um, at the most basic level, it appears that any serious attacker can always find an affordable zero day for almost any target. Let, let, let that sink in for a moment. What what that means. Um, you know, it means in essence that uh, you know a determined adversary, uh, if they uh, are committed to identifying um, a zero day in a system of interest, um, the chances are pretty good that they will uh, find one. Uh, not only that, but but at a, at a relatively affordable price. So how how, how cheap? So um, there's a company called Zerodium. Uh, you know, they, they, they hold themselves out as the world's leading exploit acquisition platform for premium zero days. Uh, and basically what they do is, uh, you know, if, if you are a security researcher and you discover a zero day vulnerability, you can go to Zerodium and sell it to them. And they will um, take that and, um, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, give it to the vendor um, and so the vendor can develop a patch. Um, but there's also a bustling black market, as you might imagine, uh, for zero-day vulnerabilities, and a gray market as well, with, with governments purchasing uh, zero-day vulnerabilities and exploits. And so here, here, what I've got here is sort of a you know, give you a sense of what the current prices are um, for um, you know for for uh, for some of these um, vulnerabilities and exploits. Um, in in the main, you know, you're, you're talking um, you know six to in some cases four in some cases six figures um you know up to a million dollars for um you know a, a a the ability to essentially break into a windows system remotely without um you know having you know without without the the, the target having to do anything um um it's a million dollars um these prices are uh you know there's been some some inflation in, in the marketplace um these used to be even cheaper um, you know, especially in the late 1990s, um, you know, you could buy zero days for a you know, hundred bucks or less, um, because there were so many of them. Um, but even so, when you think about, you know, what, what these kinds of uh, exploits and vulnerabilities allow the attacker to do, you know, so for example, at the high end, you know, break into any Windows system that has the vulnerability, uh, remotely, uh, without, um, having to trick the user into doing anything, um, a million dollars seems kind of cheap for that, um, from my perspective. And even you know, when you when you go down the list, you know, it seems even even and cheaper for some of these other other vulnerabilities. Um, so let's let's compare this to uh, a very you know kind of famous episode in the automotive industry. Um, this this problem of sudden unintended acceleration um, that that affected Toyota vehicles among others um, uh, some some ten years ago. Um, so, you know, basically the story here is, you know, there were software flaws that were alleged in the electronic con uh, throttle control system in Toyota's, um, a California state, um, patrol officer and, his, and four, three of his family members were killed in an accident when, uh, the, the, the Toyota vehicle they were driving, um, accelerated to 125, um, miles per hour before, uh, crashing. Um, a lawsuit was filed, um, and that 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 touched off just a, a whole series of, of of other lawsuits and legal actions um, around this alleged uh, flaw in in the electronic uh, throttle control system. Um, so, you know, Toyota agreed to, to compensate owners for the economic loss of their vehicles. Right, the idea being that you know because of you know this 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 vulnerability affected the market price, the resale price of their vehicles. Um, so Toyota so reached a settlement um, uh, valued at you know well over a billion dollars um, uh, to address those claims. Um, it reached a deferred criminal prosecution agreement with the Department of Justice, uh, including a 1.2 billion dollar criminal penalty. Uh, in the settlement, admitted to lying to regulators, Congress, and the public about um, about these problems. 
I paid uh, $66 million in fines to the Department of Transportation for mishandling the, the product, uh, the, the auto recall, uh, $25 million to shareholders who suffered stock price drops as a result of this, this episode. And it uh, settled somewhere around 400 uh, personal injury claims. Um, you know, we don't, I don't have good data on you know, the, the total volume of, of those claims in terms of uh, dollars paid out. But just to put you know, that in perspective, uh, a jury awarded one plaintiff uh, $3 million in compensatory damages. Um, uh, and uh, before it got to the question of punitive damages, right? Damages designed to punish the defendant, um, which could, could well exceed by many multiples in some cases, uh, compensatory damages. Uh, Toyota um, settled settled the case. Uh, so huge, huge, huge dollar amount here for Toyota. Um, and I think, you know, it kind of raises the question, it's kind of a thought experiment. You know, hindsight is always 2020, of course, but, you know, it, it, if Toyota had been able to anticipate the causes and consequences of the sudden uh, unintended uh, um, uh, acceleration, how much would it have paid for knowledge about how to present, prevent it? I, I submit to you that it would certainly be more than, than uh, far more perhaps than, than what um, a, a, you know, a vulnerability in the zero day market might, um, might fetch. Uh, if we were to sort of think, think of this, this the flaws in, in, the, in, in the electronic control, the electronic uh, throttle control system as kind of like a zero day exploit. Um, so, and I think, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is that, you know, when, when it comes to digital technologies, I think the question to ask you know, when it about risk is you know, who's left holding the hot potato when the music stops. Uh, there's a, I think this game is also played in Germany, but game of hot potato where you know, there's hot potato and the idea is no one wants to be holding the hot potato when the music stops because then you're gonna burn your hand. Um, and uh, by the way, this, 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 this hot potato is the unofficial mascot of the cyber policy program uh, that I lead at Stanford. Um, uh, in the case of digital technologies, it's often the customer or a third party who ends up holding that hot potato when the music stops. Um, so why is this the case? Well, you know, the, it, it, it turns out um, that there's a pretty, um, it all comes back to incentives. Uh, and so I'll, let's, I'll, I'll walk you through this. So, you know, First point is that there's a, a doctrine in American tort law, and, and this, this, this principle is common in other jurisdictions, including in Europe. This idea that, that um, economic loss, uh, purely economic loss, um, uh, is not available for recovery in tort uh, unless there's bodily injury or damage um, along, alongside it. Um, and so the, you know, the theory is that economic losses, purely economic losses uh, are best handled via a contract between the two parties to the transaction. Uh, you know, the vendor and the customer negotiate terms um, with the vendor's negotiating behavior, how, how hard a drive, in, how hard a bargain they, they, they drive, uh, conditioned by the ability of the customer to walk away and, and potentially find um, another uh, supplier. Um, Regulatory regimes typically put the onus on end users, uh, the regulated entity, for regulatory compliance. Um, there's there's a there's been this this global trend now for for several decades um, in, in regulatory policy of manage uh, management and performance based um, regulatory policy. Um, the idea being that you know, that the most effective way to regulate, especially in fast moving domains. Um, you know, such as those involving technology in any form, uh, which is to say most industries, uh, that the best way to regulate is to set uh, performance and management requirements and, and essentially let the, 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 the regulated entity figure out for themselves how to meet those performance requirements. Uh, it means, uh, for example, that, that regulators um, in, 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 you know, in most sectors will, will take, you know, a technology neutral approach to regulation. They, they don't sort of you know sit, tell the the regulated entity look it's, it's up to you to figure out how to achieve um you know safety security privacy or other objectives uh and uh as a practical matter that means that the technology itself the underlying technology 
it's really not not covered directly by um, by uh, by regulatory policy, right? It, the idea is that, that that the customer, in this case, the regulated entity, um, would you know would negotiate that that sort of allocation of of risk, you know, with with their vendor. Um, so vendors, uh, you know, care about their reputations, but only as much as competitive pressures um, are in place. Um, you know, uh, if competitive pressures are reduced, uh, so for example, due to network effects, um, a vendor will drive a harder, will be able to drive a harder bargain on contractual terms. Um, you know, and this this is this is the case with a lot of a lot of digital technologies where, um, you know, if it, you know, a company like you know, it's especially true of, of a company like Microsoft before you know, file compatibility um, sort of turned a corner. Uh, some 15 years ago, where you sort of, you know, you were either, you know, you either used a Microsoft product or you, you used a Lotus product. Uh, and, um, you know, the value of using the Microsoft product grew the more uh, uh, Microsoft users there were. Uh, but it also meant that, you know, that, uh, that switching uh, to a different um, product, say Lotus Notes, uh, was costly, right? Because you'd have to deal with all these interoperability challenges. And so it had, it had the effect of kind of locking in um, customers. This happens all the time, and, and this is one of the quirks or features or bugs, depending on your perspective of, 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 of software, of many software markets. Um, modern businesses and, and consumers cannot not use digital technology, so walking away is really not always a practical option. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're digital technologies are essential for participation in society and the global economy, so walking away is just not a practical option in, 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 in many cases. Um, the, the contracts, so if we go back to this idea that the econo around the economic loss doctrine, this idea that that allocation of risk is best handled uh, by contract when it comes to purely economic loss, um, contracts for digital technologies typically include uh, liability disclaimers and paper thin um, as is warranties in which you know, the vendor is, for, you know, is essentially transferring um, risk to the customer uh, for any um, losses um, Associated with uh, with use of of the product, um, and then finally, you know, when um, when tort is available, you know, if, if a product does cause bodily injury or damage um, to uh, to to property other than the digital technology itself, uh, recovering tort requires proving key elements, um, including actual damages, uh, causation, all of which uh, you know can be challenging to do in any tort case, but um, just given the complexity of digital technologies, uh, it can be especially challenging to parse out what actually happened um, in an accident or some other, um, you know, case where, where harm uh, was caused. Um, so, from this perspective, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if, if 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 at the end of the day, vendors are not the ones holding the hot potato, it's customers. It makes a lot of sense that they wouldn't have uh, as strong an incentive uh, to pay. For, for you know to remediate zero day vulnerabilities right because they're not the ones you know who bear uh, most of the risk um, so I think though there are, there are two major changes afoot that that are going to complicate this this kind of status quo picture of of how risk is allocated um, uh, when it comes to digital technologies um, there are changes to uh, digital technologies right uh, first, uh, rise of smart connected products. Um, you know, I have uh, Porter and Heffelman um, have done some really good work on this. I, I, I recommend taking a look at their articles. Um, they're kind of relative oldies, but goodies at this point. Um, they do a really good job kind of capturing, I think, the business uh, zeitgeist around um, all the exciting, um, you know, uh, applications and, and, and implications of smart connected products. Uh, and then the other major change is in expectations for for governance, and I'll, I'll elaborate more on more on each of these. Um, so let's start with um, the, the the first change: the rise of smart connected products. Um, we're sort of in the midst of uh, what what Porter Heppelman call a third wave of IT innovation. Uh, it builds on uh, sort of two preceding waves. Uh, the first wave. Uh, you know, really kind of began in the 1960s and 1970s um, and involved the commoditization of IT, 
uh, that enabled activities in the value chain uh, to be automated. So you start to see you know, um, ordering, invoicing, resource planning, all um, supported by, um, by IT. Uh, the second wave emerges in the, 18, in the 1980s and 1990s with the rise of the internet. Um, activities um, in the value chain um, are, um, are able to be more coordinated, integrated uh, across business units, across vendors, across customers. Um, and then, you know, this, this, this third wave, um, now, uh, if, if the first two waves uh, cause changes to the value chain, this third wave is now changing the very nature of things um, as connectivity processing and sensing um, gets embedded into things uh, with these things often um, supported by, uh, by cloud services. So let's take a closer look at, at what this means for the automobile. So, um, I, I pulled these wonderful uh, charts from Apti, which is a company um, that, that uh, specializes in, in automotive um, uh, uh, um, electronics architecture. Um, I have no relationship with them. I just like their charts. Uh, it's really good. Here's a snapshot of sort of the first, the first wave of IT, right? So it doesn't sort of hit automobiles until kind of the 1980s. Um, and what you see is, you know, uh, you know this 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 leap in the, the amount of, of of electronic connections in a car, um, along with 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 computers. Um, the uh, the the driver for this uh, there were there were sort of two uh, main drivers, uh, and it, so you know IT is commoditized. I mean, it gets it gets cheaper. It gets you know uh, you know. It gets um, smaller, um, and you had this drive beginning in the late 1970s and early 1980s towards um, reduced emissions. And what what the auto industry discovered is, wow, you know, if we if we're able to replace um, mechanical components with wires and electronic control units, we can reduce the weight of the car. We can also use sensors to optimize engine performance. Um, and uh, reduce emissions that way. And so this, this kind of dawning environmental consciousness in, in, into the late 1970s, early 1980s, especially around fuel emissions, um, uh, you know, drives this, this initial turn to, to uh, embed um, at least uh, basic connectivity and processing and sensing into automobiles. But as you can see, it's still very much kind of a self-contained um, unit. It hasn't really fundamentally changed the nature of the car. Okay, we look ahead now, um, you know, the second wave, right, the rise of the internet, um, it's it sort of that wave, you know, begins to hit automobiles um, kind of towards the end of the late 1990s, early 2000s, but you, you could really see, start to see it kind of crest um, by the 2010s, where now, you know, by comparison to the 1980s, um, you know, you can see from the diagram that the number of, of connections, um, the amount of data that's, that's, that's transmitted uh, within the car, um, has, has, has increased, uh, you know, vastly. Um, and, you know, here as well, it's, it's, it's you know, the drivers are um, emissions performance, um, uh, safety, right? You know, as, as, as uh, these, these, techno these digital technologies are enabling things like, um, uh, like you know, airbags and, and um, later electronic stability control to be baked into, into automobiles at a cost-effective uh, Price, all of which requires, um, you know, sensing, processing, connectivity. But here, still, you know, the car, you know, the car hasn't really changed. It's still a car. It still feels like a car. Um, now, you know, as we look ahead, you know, sort of as at the very beginning of the of, the, of this third wave, where the, the very nature of things is changing, we see obviously the, the, these trends of of you know of um, you know, connectivity, sensing, processing, all continuing, right? Driven again by engine performance, by safety. Uh, we also see this, you know, demand for, um, you know, integrating, um, you know, the services, you know, that we rely on at home, right? Internet service, for example, the ability to use our smartphones everywhere we are into the car itself. Uh, meanwhile, the car is, 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 is uh, communicating more and more with the outside world. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, we now have automation, uh, we're sort of the early stages of, of automation and electrification, which I think points us to uh, some real changes in the very nature of what, what a car is. It's no longer, you know, if we look ahead to the future, it's no longer this vehicle 
you know, that um, I drive from point A to point B. It's, it's, it's almost a platform uh, that I use um, uh, to, to, to travel and, and conduct business in some cases. Um, and so, you know, and this, this, this trend, I, I use automobiles, as, as Dan said, the top is kind of an example um, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one, I think it's, it's um, an area of, of where this phenomenon of stuff getting smarter and more connected, um, you know, we will experience it as consumers and as pedestrians uh, more readily and more directly just because of how important and ubiquitous cars are to um, to our daily in our, in our daily lives. Um, I also think it's um, you know it's of huge strategic importance to uh, to the United States, obviously to Germany um, and and other you know democracies that are all trying to work through um, how to go how to how to establish governance regimes around digital technologies. Um, while at the same time um, you know figuring out how to deal with with China's rise, which which we can come back to. Uh, so Japan and South Korea, for example, stand out as other. Other examples where the automobile is, I think, is a, is a strategically vital um, part of their economy. And then, last but not least, um, you know, it, it's a great vehicle for bad dad puns. Um, you know, I, I, I'm able to steer uh, the conversation uh, in, in lots of different directions. Um, my students often ask me to tap the brakes on the bad puns, but you know, I just keep driving ahead. Um, okay, so. In, in, you know, just again, using cars as an example, let's let's revisit, you know, some of the reasons why um, liability um, for digital technologies has, has sort of not really prov provoked much of a response in the marketplace, using the zero day market as kind of a, a proxy for how much vendors care about um, digital risks uh, in their products. Right, so uh, revisiting the economic loss doctrine, which limits tort liability to bodily injury, um, smart connected products, uh, especially, you know, in the case of cars, uh, I think we can expect more losses associated with bodily injury and other property, um, as a result of accidents, uh, for example, um, you know, whereas regulatory regimes typically put the onus on end users, um, vice vendors for compliance purposes, I think that line is getting blurred, especially as we look ahead to automation where, where the integration of algorithms and data, um, in many ways are going to blur the line between who the customer uh, of the technology is and who the vendor of that technology is. They're, they're gonna have a more sort of blended responsibility for what that product is. Again, I think that's especially the case in, um, you know, in, 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 uh, for machine learning uh, um, applications uh, of which I think autos is, is, is going to be, you know, a, a real prominent and, uh, example. Plus, you know, there, there is this growing focus on, on, on the underlying uh, technology. Um, you know, if, if, if for many decades, this idea of, you know, regulatory policy being technology neutral was kind of the, the coin of the, the regulatory realm, I'm seeing some, some early indication that's changing, uh, especially when it comes to AI. Um, you know, we're seeing um, you know, just this, this explosion of interest um, in, um, in uh, how to achieve governance regimes for artificial intelligence. Uh, the, the, the commission's recent proposed AI law, I think is a great example of this um, that will blur the line between uh, vendors and end users. Um, you know, vendors you know, care about the reputations. That is uh, of course true. Um, uh, but you know, if, 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 they're, if they're able to drive a harder bargain because of network effects, because of lock-in, um, you know, their their willingness to you know the, the the ability of the customer to walk away is diminished, but I think you know that's that's different though when we're talking about safety risks as opposed to more conventional sort of you know um, data breaches. Um, when people get hurt, uh, that that just attracts attention uh, more than um, other uh, you know episodes or, or, or accidents involving digital technologies. Um, just look at the case of Toyota again in the su sudden unintended uh, acceleration example. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, they, they, they settled um, the cases, I believe, because they were, A, they were concerned that if they ended up going to trial, uh, either, you know, for, for both uh, the civil and criminal, um, you know, actions, they might lose more money than, than uh, if they had settled. Um, but I also think they, they had an interest in sort of getting, moving past the, the controversy, um, because the controversy was damaging uh, their reputation as a manufacturer of, of, of of safe vehicles. Um, we're seeing you know, privacy risks carry, uh, carrying increased stigma um, 
I think we have GDPR to thank uh, for that. Um, um, but you know, it, it, it's more than just you know um, a you know uh, threat of sort of regulatory fine. I think you know consumers themselves are starting to you know at least you know express more interest in in privacy uh, protective technologies. Uh, you know, big companies have kind of staked. Uh, some of their marketing strategies around being more privacy protective than others with Apple you know, kind of standing out as an example. Um, you know, moving down to, you know, the, the, the current ability to sort of include liability disclaimers and, 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 and thin warranties, um, you know, disclaiming bodily injury uh, or, or damage to third parties is just not as straightforward a thing to do. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail that gets kind of into the tort weeds, but um, that's a, a, an important change worth flagging. And then I think, you know, um, yes, it's proven really difficult in a lot of cases to prove damages um, when, you know, there's an, uh, you know, an incident involving, um, you know, say a cyber, a cyber breach. Um, but, you know, we're seeing this, this trend of, you know, statutory damages, again, with GDPR being um, a great example of, of, you know, a law that, that um, you know, doesn't require you know, plaintiffs to prove, um, you know, causation and damages, which, which can be really challenging in, in conventional tort cases. It, 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 you know, there's a statutory, you know, uh, damage um, that's, that's there. Um, the harm is often more, you know, especially if there's, if there's bodily injury, the harm is more obvious. You know, if, if, if a Tesla veers off the road and crashes into you know, a barrier, that, that that's, you know, it's, it's obvious what happened, at least outwardly. Um, it's not, it's not a subtle accident. Um, and then I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate in, in among, um, you know, lawyers and, 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 and legal scholars around whether, uh, we'll, we'll see a strict liability regime coming for, for at least some kinds of digital technologies, uh, where questions of causation, um, you know, become essentially, um, moot. Um, so uh, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, turn the fan on him. Yeah, let's turn the fan on, see if he even notices. All right, all the, something just turned on all the fans and AC and stuff. I didn't do that. The trick started small. Oh my God. That was a picture of Charlie and Chris in track suits that just appeared on the dashboard. But as I drove down the interstate, things started getting unpleasant and very loud. <laughs> I gotta do it. Do it. Kill the engine. So we're killing the engine right now. I stomped on the gas, but the Jeep slowed to a crawl. I turned on my hazard lights, but I was still stuck in the right lane with no shoulder to escape onto. Guys, I'm stuck on the highway. Oh, I think he's panicking. He's not going to be able to hear us with that radio. It's so loud. Guys, I need the accelerator to work again. All right, so yeah, you get the idea. Um, so I've seen it. Whoops. So that that was um, uh, a hack uh, conducted by by two uh, very well known security researchers, Chris uh, uh, Balasek and Charlie Miller uh, of a Jeep Cherokee, um, with Andy Greenberg, a, a reporter from Wired Magazine, um, as the driver, uh, and, and and basically yeah, they they were able to t exploit um, some some flaws in in uh, certain parts of the vehicle, including the the head unit, the the radio, and the you know in the car. Um, to ultimately uh, take control of the car and, and kill the engine. Uh, this, this episode um, led to a recall of uh, you know, millions of, of, of affected vehicles uh, in the Fiat Chrysler um, family, uh, as well as lawsuits. Um, and uh, you know, it's just a big, a big mess. But this sort of, you know, I think is kind of the, the tip of the iceberg of, of what you know, this, this move towards uh, the, the kinds of risks that, that, that um, that this move towards uh, smart connected vehicles uh, products with, with vehicles as, as an example uh, portents. So let's now jump into um, the other change I mentioned, uh, changing expectations for, 
for governance. Um, I, I think that we are, you know, it's hard to say how far we are into it. Um, at least a few years into what I call a regulatory renaissance for digital technologies. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, both, in, you know, especially in, in Europe and China, but even the United States, a, a renewed push uh, towards uh, building uh, more robust governance regimes for managing the risks associated with, um, with use of digital technologies. Uh, risks including privacy, safety, cybersecurity, uh, competition, um, you know, uh, discrimination, digital divide, national security. Um, we're also seeing, you know, different sectors uh, approach these risk verticals, uh, you know, through their own sort of sectoral lens, whether it's transportation, healthcare, finance, uh, consumer protection, um, to name to name just a few. Um, I, the, the challenge now is, you know, how how to achieve uh, integration across these verticals. Um, and I think, you know, this, this is a, I have a, a, a site there to some work I've done with Martin Schaubrook, uh, a, a friend and, and collaborator um, who's based at ESMT in Berlin um, that we've done really kind of highlighting how this, you know, this, this, this move to develop risk verticals uh, in each regulatory regimes, governance regimes in each of these risk verticals uh, risks, you know, cr creates this, this integration challenge where um, risk decisions in one domain um, have impacts on the other domains. And so I'll give you an example in, in the context of, of automobiles. Um, so you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the example, we just saw that the hack of the, in 2015 of the Jeep Cherokee by the two cybersecurity researchers, uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities led to a potential safety risk. Um, those same cybersecurity vulnerabilities, those, those, those same cybersecurity risks could give rise to privacy risks. And the, and the challenge now for, 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 for businesses as they try to sort of optimize across these risks and for, gov and for governments as they begin to develop, you know, uh, governance strategies and regulatory regimes as part of this regulatory renaissance is how to achieve integration across these risk verticals so that they're mutually reinforcing and that requirements or incentives in one risk vertical don't create unintended consequences um, in, in other uh, risk uh, verticals. Um, I think, so why, why, don't I, why, why don't I stop there? Um, I, I wanna make sure that we leave uh, plenty of time uh, for, for Q&A. Um, I'm happy to revisit uh, some of these themes. I'm also, as, as, as Dan said, prepared to talk about um, Really, any 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 issue under the digital sun that that's on your minds? Um, I, I know there's you know a lot of interest in China these days. Uh, to put it mildly, I'm happy to to spend some time talking about that. It's of interest, but in general, I look forward to your questions. Uh, well, thank you for that, Andy. My uh, head is kind of spinning, um, so I want to start off by just asking one semi-factual question um, in one of your slides, uh, in the slide entitled Revisiting Risk and Liability Exposure. Uh, you said we should expect more losses associated with bodily injury and, and other property. Um, isn't the whole idea of this uh, accelerating automation to reduce the amount of injury and uh, other property, or isn't that the the boast that it's going to be vastly safer, or uh, what did I miss here? Is this just means that that to the firms those losses will be um, considerably will be in, enhanced because it's ultimately the losses are being caused by a glitch in software or something like that, as opposed to a drunk driver. That's great. It's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it because um, it gives me an opportunity to to kind of, you know, lean a little bit into the, the positive side of digital technology. You know, I, I, you know, when we talk about risk management, right, that that's, you know, that's, you know, you kind of put your doom and gloom hat on and think about all the bad things that can happen. But we've got to remember that, um, you know, that, that these changes, uh, you know, just you coming back to the car as an example, right? Like, you know, th these changes that began uh, in the you know, 70s and early 80s, um, were the, 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 the a response to a desire to make cars cleaner and safer. 
and the result is obviously cars are 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 you know cleaner and safer today than they were you know 30 years ago and that that wouldn't have been possible without digital technologies being baked into automobiles um so you know and and it's that value proposition that that's driving digi digitalization in the first place my my concern my point is that what 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 that's doing though is changing the sort of the, the constellation of risks that businesses um, who are you know either using or selling smart connected products and governments who are tasked with you know developing governance regimes to protect their citizens uh, and advance their citizens' interests, it, it changes that constellation of risks. And if you know in the past. Um, you know, if we if we come back to this hot potato metaphor, um, oftentimes, you know, the 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 actor left holding the risk is the end user, right? So, for example, right, um, and if if you're, I, I mean, I, I love Apple products, but I'll pick on Apple a little bit here. You know, if if you are using, you know, your your iMac as I'm doing now. To give a presentation, but to, uh, I'll up the stakes to, to, for a job interview, and the computer fails because of a flaw in Apple's software, and that causes me harm. Right, I, I lose, you know, um, uh, you know, disrupts the interview, or may, maybe it's a sales call, you know, and and, and damage results. Um, the way that 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 the the current sort of framework for um, who owns that risk is set up is I, I own that risk. Apple has very little risk. They have some reputational risk, right? But, but in many cases, that reputational risk is attenuated by the fact that uh, the competitive pressures that they feel, um, as well as the fact that, you know, it's not like I can't use, especially in a, in a time of COVID, a computer to communicate, uh, means that, you know, I'm still gonna have to go to some other provider. And, and that just, that, that that has given, I think, the vendors uh, considerable um, uh, market power. Um, and in light of that market power, you know, you, it, it stands to, it makes, I think, a lot of sense that, that, that their willingness to, to, to pay uh, to, 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 you know, to deal with security vulnerabilities is less than it might otherwise be. Um, right, so, you know, looking at automobiles, I think, um, you know, coming back to you know this you know this case, um, there's you know for 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 you know for many decades um, autos the idea of a car getting hacked and that hack resulting in an accident was just wasn't 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 in the realm of possible because the cars themselves just didn't have you know the 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 level of connectivity and um, you know, and, 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 and accessibility to hackers that they do today. That's a new risk that, that, that um, you know, that automakers, you know, new as in, you know, say past 15 years, that automakers have to figure out how to manage that they didn't have to figure out before. Um, it's a risk ironically created by this, this drive towards improved safety, improved emissions, and, 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 and you know, and, and improved consumer experience. Um, you know, and, and, and so that 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 that's that's the 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 point I'm trying to make is that th this this the liability landscape, how risk is allocated um, in that landscape is shifting, and I think it's going to create um, new and 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 you know from a researcher standpoint, very interesting challenges around uh, you know, corporate governance as well as how uh, governments um, set regulatory policy. Yeah, I could spend the rest of the evening thinking about the implications of that. So, um, but let me just put to you a, a hypothetical. Uh, I'm sitting in the back seat of my uh, automated car, uh, self-driving car, and uh, the car, you know, drives um, uh, into the uh, median divider and uh, I wind up with a broken leg. Um, presumably, um, you know, it's gonna be the firm, the company uh, that is going to be somehow liable for that screw up 
Um, and if it's a, the result of some kind of mal, you know, um, malfeasance, you know, if, if they've left open a vulnerability and someone else has done it, then they're vulnerable for that too. It's not just bad software, it's for, um, it's bad, uh, it, it's bad, um, you know, product safety work. So am I getting you right that the, 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 uh, the shift is going to be not to the end user, but to the, the last vendor. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 you know, I think autos are, are again, a great example of this for, for the reason in your example, because I mean, that the most dangerous um, feature of any automobile is the driver you know, and concurrent technology, right? I mean, you know, humans cause the vast majority of accidents. And I, I don't think there's any question that replacing humans with, you know, an appropriately tested and validated, you know, um, machine learning algorithm is going to result in fewer traffic fatalities. That's a good thing. But it also means now that the vendor, the menu, you know, the OEM is on the hook for accidents in ways that they never were uh, before. They're, they're now in, you know, quote unquote, the driver. Um, you know, and, and the risk calculation gets even more complicated by the fact that there's going to be a period of, you know, decades and maybe forever where there are both automated and non-automated vehicles on the road. Uh, and questions emerge there of, okay, well, if there's an accident between an automated vehicle and a non-automated vehicle, how should we think about liability in that case? Um, you know, and so it, it's, it's, it's trying to think through, you know, how these, these um, you know, the, these changes in the nature of products along with, and, and their effect on, on risk, along with this, this, this renaissance we're in, uh, I think, uh, around governance of digital technologies, uh, will, you know, achieve a level of optimization that allows the technologies to move forward into the marketplace, uh, while at the same time, yeah, and, and so that we are able to take advantage of all the benefits that, that come with with them, while at the same time, you know, ensuring that that that, that liability is allocated, that risk is allocated in a way that uh, ensures cost-effective risk mitigations are, are put in place. Uh, and I think, you know, because for, for the reasons we talked about, the vendors are going to have to pick, they're gonna be picking up more of that responsibility in ways they have in the past. Well, it sounds like it's gonna be a boom time for insurers as well, um, but not for, uh, you know, consumer insurance, but rather for, you know, the insurance of the, of the firms to make sure they get their products right. You know, given the enormous amount of software that's gonna go into uh, the cars that we're describing, I think back to your chart about uh, zero days and I just uh, have to wonder if, you know, we're on the verge of the creation of an enormous uh, explosion in criminal enterprise trying to exploit uh, uh, flaws in the, in the code. Yeah, you know, that, that is, um, so there was a, a class action lawsuit um, that uh, plaintiffs uh, filed against uh, Fiat Chrysler in connection with um, the, the Jeep Cherokee uh, hack um, uh, in which they, you know, they, the allegation in part was, you know, the fact that, that well, they, they argued that, you know, that, 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 that the cars, the, the, the defects haven't fully been remediated. Therefore, the value of the car has diminished. Um, and uh, by the way, you know, like there's a growing sort of, you know, uh, threat landscape, um, um, you know, uh, that, that, that's going to make cars an even more attractive target for malicious actors. Um, full, full disclosure, um, what, so th that case uh, was, uh, dismissed uh, about, a, I think about this time last year, uh, largely because we go back to, um, you know, this, this here, you know, the, the plaintiffs had a really hard time proving damage. Um, you know, it, the damages, the judge said, well, you know, okay, like, okay, 
show, where's the damage, right? Are the car's value as it actually diminished? If not, then you know you, you haven't you know, you haven't really proved um, damage. Um, I was uh, full disclosure um, an expert witness in that case um, for the plaintiffs, um, where um, I was asked to talk about the threat landscape um, and um, you know without going into too many details, um, I, I really zeroed in on on uh, ransomware attacks. Um, you know, and I, I think. That argument is, 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 has been kind of somewhat vindicated, unfortunately, by the colonial pipeline hack. Um, but, you know, I, I think about, you know, ransomware attacks on, on automobiles, um, you know, timed to coincide with, you know, in the United States, you know, Thanksgiving holiday when everyone's going to hop in their car and travel, um, with, you know, rush hour in Berlin, uh, as everyone's trying to get to the, you know, and, you know, you end up with, you know, causing, you um, you know, uh, really kind of holding people hostage, um, and I think the missing link uh, is so far as a, a way to monetize. Um, you know, it's a, it's a way for the adversaries to sort of extract that. You know, extract the ransom. Uh, Bitcoin is what has enabled that to happen. Um, you know, in in you know more broadly, but um, you know, I think uh, cars. You know. Get, f figuring out how to like you know get the driver who wants to solve the ransomware problem in ten minutes because they got to get to work is a harder challenge you know you know than 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 you know giving an organization seventy two hours to pay a ransom where they have time to like you know get a get a buy Bitcoin you know get get their infrastructure in place to make the payment um, but that, that I think that's the missing link um, and it's why when I saw Tesla. Um, a couple months ago announced a big Bitcoin buy, which I think they've now walked back from. My first reaction was, okay, well, you know, uh, you know, as soon as Tesla integrates Bitcoin payments into the into their vehicle, like they're gonna get they're gonna get ransomware attacked, right? Because now the adversaries um, are gonna have a way to extract value in the you know quicker, right? On a timeline that that's gonna make their um, you know their 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 attack uh, felt. So I was wondering if that was a hedge because they would if there was a lot of ransomware, uh, then they would see the value of Bitcoin go up. But um, uh, <laughs> uh, you could look at this from many different ways. So you use the phrase, uh, and it's a striking one because I don't think we've ever really thought of it in these terms before, the uh, a, a regulation renaissance. Most people don't usually put those together. Um, so there's certainly a vast demand for new regulation. Would you still, what, what is the case that there is a regulation renaissance? Well, I think, um, start with Europe. Uh, you know, you look at, um, I mean, GDPR is probably the, uh -huh. the you know, maybe the, the moment when, you know, historians of the regulatory renaissance will, you know, date its start. Um, but you know, there's, there's, um, you should just spell out the, uh, acronym for those who don't know. Oh yeah. Sorry. The, the, the general data, data protection regulation. Um, uh, there's the, um, the, the, the NIS, uh, directive on cybersecurity and it's proposed, uh, follow on the NIST two proposal, um, that the commission uh, proposed at the end of last year. Um, there's the AI, uh, law that the commission proposed, um, just, I think what a month ago or so. Um, there's a lot of work underway, uh, you know, on uh, on liability issues around digital technologies. I think I, for, I forget what what form it took. I think it may have been a c communication um, last year on 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 um, like like consumer like liability and, and digital technologies. Uh, competition and antitrust is obviously a hot topic um, in Europe. Uh, but you know, Europe's not the only you know uh, you know uh, institution in the mix. Uh, China. In many ways, is moving even faster. Um, you know, China um, three weeks ago put out um, the second draft of its personal information privacy law. Um, ch uh, China's cybersecurity law is out. Um, it's pursuing uh, you know a number of other regulatory initiatives that are more sector uh, focused. Um, here in the United States, um, you know we have frankly uh, lagged. Uh, you know, for better or worse, depending on your perspective um, and how wise a fair your orientation is. Uh, when it comes to this stuff, but um, it's obvious there's a tech lash underway that, that's bipartisan. Um, How do you explain you know, are, that term? Yeah, so your tech lash is this like, 
is this backlash against uh, the big, especially the big social media providers in Washington um, following the 2016 presidential election where you had, um, you know, sort of one set of stakeholders, primarily, you know, Democrats and others on the left, but some Republicans uh, criticizing the, the, the social media platforms for not doing enough to counter um, Russian disinformation on the platforms in 2016. Uh, it's that's sort of since kind of, you know, uh, you know, grown now to cover a lot more um, than just disinformation, you know, uh, privacy, cybersecurity are both top of mind um, in the Congress, even if, you know, co Congress hasn't been able to legislate yet, there's, there's a, you know, a, there are a bunch of competing bills um, on, 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 on privacy. Um, you know, the, the Biden administration issued uh, an executive order on cybersecurity that I think uh, will prove to be um, pretty impactful. Um, we can you know, talk about that a little bit uh, if there's interest. Um, but at the, at the state level, um, you know, California, uh, my home state, um, uh, had enacted, uh, I think two years ago now, a consumer privacy law that's um, GDPR-like in, in many respects, but also um, unique to California in many other respects. Uh, and so, yeah, so there's just a, there's a lot of, of activity um, and uh, even, you know, uh, you know b beyond just sort of debate and hand-wringing, there's, you know, there's just, there, there, there are actual laws uh, on the books or, or under uh, development uh, in, in these three key markets. Um, so that, that, that's what I mean by regulatory. Okay. So um, this dovetails well with a question from the audience, from someone who knows government uh, very well. And he writes, uh, the EU, the European Union is seeking to jump ahead of the US and you've pretty much described that, um, although part of it may be uh, American negligence, but it's, it's jumping ahead of the US and others to become the regulatory platform for the new era. What are the prospects uh, big question for a common approach with the U.S. That's a great question, um, and let me jump ahead a little bit. Right, so I, 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 I mean, kind of the question that the way I put the question, you know, is is you know, Europe, the U.S., and China, all three are competing over whose image uh, will be most reflected in market defining rules and norms for digital technology. And I think the question is like who's you know, whose governance regime will reign supreme? Uh, Europe, which certainly like, um, you know, has made a big play uh, for its um, approach. Um, but um, China is also making a a, a major play, and um, I, I think that that this competition uh, th that that it is by no means assured that Europe's vision will prevail. Um, you know, I can I can go into a little bit of detail um, if interested. Maybe maybe I'll go into detail in brief. I sort of think about um, you know, when it comes to like you know the the ability to project influence um, from a governance perspective into sort of four uh, categories: uh, the domestic market, um, industrial policy, the, the, the innovation ecosystem, and and and, the, and regulatory culture. And I think China is hits the mark on all four. Um, pretty well, um, you know. Obviously, you know, massive domestic market, um, but e even more than that, um, you know, China has uh, this this real strength in, in 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 kind of this breakneck product to market cycle, where uh, even in many ways more so than the U than the U.S., it, in a, entrepreneurs are able to take an idea and get it to market like lightning fast in China. Um, and that's sort of, you know, uh, on the other end of that, paired with um, an enormous consumer appetite for innovative products. Uh, Chinese consumers, um, compared to uh, their European and American um, peers, uh, appear to be more willing to embrace new technologies. I think a great example of this is fintech um, and mobile payments in particular, where if you look at the extent to which um, mobile payments have, have, have taken off in China compared to Europe and the United States, it's just... It's, it's, it's an incredible uh, um, uh, development and, and uh, industrial policy, you know, China's industrial policy is infamous, uh, muscular and multifaceted. Its innovation ecosystem is ascendant. Um, you know, I'll note that Huawei, you know, the infamous Huawei has a multi-year streak for the most patent applications at the EPO. Um, and its regulatory culture is creative and empowered. I, I don't think this part of the China 
question gets enough attention. Um, and it's, it's easy to be cynical about China's intentions and, and there's plenty about uh, the Chinese Communist Party's intentions to be cynical about, uh, but it's a huge mistake, I think, to uh, ignore the fact that uh, regulators in that country are dealing with many of the same challenges as we are when it comes to privacy, cybersecurity, uh, safety, and uh, are, are trying to, you know, earnestly work through, um, you know, what it what it will take to 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 build a governance framework uh, for technologies that you know supports innovation and 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 protects people from from bad things happening. Um, you know, if we sort of begin to, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, kind of rack and stack. Uh, to where, how the U.S. and Europe compare. Um, this, this, I should say, builds on um, work that Martin Shelbrook and I have done together. Um, um, alone, neither Europe nor the United States has all, I, I would argue, ha, ha, has all four factors in place, right? So obviously the U.S. and Europe both have big domestic markets. And when you think of them together, it's by far the biggest market, you know, bilateral market in the world. Um, you know, the U.S. innovation ecosystem is, is still unmatched, um, you know, for, for all China's progress. I still think we, uh, I'm very um, bullish on, on, on our innovation ecosystem, um, even if I don't take it for granted uh, over the long term. Um, you know, the U.S. is weak on industrial policy. Um, we don't, a lot of people say we don't do industrial policy. That's not quite true. We just do it with the tax code, which is, you know, uh, you know, kind of, you um, ripe for rent seeking and other, you know, um, mis mis misbehavior. Um, regulatory culture in the US, I would describe as, you know, this is a generalization, but I would describe it as mostly uh, demoralized and stagnant. Um, you know, our political system, um, you know, has essentially, you know, framed regulators as um, kind of no good bureaucrats. Um, and, uh, you know, that that is just I think been a real barrier to um, to the U.S. thinking more strategically and creatively around how to manage um, risk, especially when it comes to digital technologies. And that this is on this is bipartisan, you know. Um, even if one party is, you know, a little more focused on on demonizing regulators than the other, um, Europe's you know has um, I think a a, a a an empowered and creative regulatory culture in addition to its its domestic market. Um, but you know, as, as far as industrial policy goes, you know. There's sort of an irony here. I mean, Europe began. Europe's roots are in industrial policy, right? You know, the famous, you know, marriage of, of French farmers with, you know, German, you know, coal and steel, um, and you know, throw in nuclear for good measure. Um, but, but today, it's about you know, market integration and upholding fundamental rights. With industrial policy, is really kind of faded. Uh, I would argue into the background. Um, Europe's innovation ecosystem, and, and I know, you know, I, I'd be curious to hear what others think. Um, I, I think punch is way below its weight, uh, given um, the size of the market, the sophistication of, of its educational institutions, um, its uh, banking environment. Um, uh, and, uh, and then I think, you know, I would put, you know, even if, even if its regulatory culture is, um, is empowered and creative, I do think that there, there are a lot of challenges still with trying to achieve integration across risk verticals, uh, picking up a theme I talked about earlier in the, in the, in the talk. Um, you know, you look at, um, for example, uh, NIST2 and DORA um, uh, and GDPR as examples where, you know, they have, they have kind of competing, uh, you know, data breach notification requirements. Um, you know, there are, uh, it's not evident to me that there's a ton of sort of, cr of Productive crosstalk among, um, you know, the 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 communities, uh, the governance communities in these domains um, in Europe, um, and I think that's a real challenge moving forward. U.S. and Europe together, though, I think, can more than match China's strengths, uh, and and so I, I do think uh, to to, you know, kind of come back to, um, the 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 the, the questioner's original question now is, you know. Yes, I, I think that's, uh, I don't think Europe can compete head to head with China when it comes to um, uh, sort of exporting governance over the long term. I think China is, is poised to either at least match Europe's influence, um, but possibly exceed it in certain parts of the world. Um, but if you put US and Europe together, um, I think uh, it's a formidable duo. And, and obviously that then begs the question, okay, what does that look like? Um, I have a couple of recommendations on that front. Um, 
you know, the US, I think, you know, we got to get our regulatory house in order. I think in Europe, you know, I think Europe needs to pursue integration across uh, policy verticals and, um, um, and uh, you know, both, uh, I think, uh, need to figure out how to build more regulator to regulator ties um, um, and uh, figure out, you know, work, work together to identify how to optimize, um, you know, trade-offs across um, risk verticals so that, you know, we, we, we don't end up with a situation where, you know, data protection laws inter inadvertently interfere with cybersecurity objectives, uh, where cybersecurity laws, you know, don't appropriately advance safety objectives and, and so on. So um, let me just uh, press you a little uh, on this issue because you've sort of done a, a net assessment of everyone's strengths, but what about the question of how much uh, the US and, and Europe uh, want to uh, achieve this kind of uh, common approach? What, what's your yeah. sense of the arc uh, in, this, uh, in this area? So th th there's a, you know, a ton of talk in Washington around this idea of sort of an alliance of democracies around tech. Um, I know that, you know, that um, th in Brussels, you know, there's a lot of interest in this as well. You know, there was the, um, you know, there was a, the, the, the report the commission put out, and I think it was October of last, October or November of last year on transatlantic cooperation. There was the uh, invitation more recently uh, for a dialogue, um, which I know there's some, um, you know, uh, consternation among Euro European members of the European Parliament that the Biden administration hasn't taken them up on that offer yet. Um, I had a conversation with several of them about a week and a half ago and said, be patient. Um, so there's demand, right? Uh, the hard part is, okay, like, yeah, how does one translate that, that mutual interest, that mutual demand into a, you know, a practical agenda uh, that's outcome oriented and, um, and, that, and that's obviously a tougher task. Um, I, I think, you know, my, my bias is to take a big problem um, like this, right? This, this competition around you know, governance for digital technologies and, you know, try to break it into smaller pieces. And so I, I would, you know, if, if I were uh, advising um, the Biden administration, I would, I would, I would tell them, look, like, you know, you, you got to have some strategic level dialogue, uh, but don't, don't let that bog down pr regulator to regulator, peer to peer engagement. Uh, so picking up on autos as an example, um, you know, there were, you know, during the TTIP negotiations, um, you know, autos, was, you know, regulatory policy was, was, was one of the sticky points. You know, it was, it was an issue that where, um, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the objective of sort of mutual recognition of safety standards uh, was proving to be really hard to meet just because of how different the, the two jurisdictions um, handle auto safety regulatory policy. Uh, you know, I, I like to think that, I mean, that was what, five, six years ago. Um, and, you know, the world has changed in that period of time. But more importantly, like, you know, the market has changed. I mean, you know, the way, you know, the way that if you go back to, you know, 2000 and, you know, 14 um, era, um, you know, this third wave of technology uh, was just barely coming into focus, right? That was when, you know, Porter and Heffelman wrote their article, which I think was spot on. Um, and it's only now that we're really, I think, beginning to, 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 to see the, the full potential for what this means uh, for, for autos. Um, and uh, when you overlay, I think, um, the, the, the China element here, where you know for uh, for German automakers in particular, um, I mean it is arguably their most important market at this point, um, perhaps more so even than the domestic market. Um, yet, you know, putting big bets on China comes with all sorts of risks that I think have become clearer, uh, you know, not, not just to American policymakers but to European policymakers and business leaders as well over the last few years. And you know, I, I like to think that, that that these factors 
could give new life to a dialogue over um, auto safety standards. Um, some of that's happening already, but you know, I, I, that there feels like there's, and then there are other domains that may have similar, you know, a similar sort of regulator to regulator uh, dimension to them. That that that's you know complementary to a, a more strategic level kind of senior dialogue, um, but doesn't necessarily have to get sort of bogged down in in the process and you know and and grand strategy that 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 um, the big kind of you know dialogues can often um, consume. So one of our um, uh, viewers uh, writes in that he participated in an EU US working group on driver distraction guidelines and regulations. Uh, proposals were made to both the US and the EU. Um, uh, the participants in the group were told that both were committed to implementing the proposals. The US reacted slowly. And uh, even many years after, it looks like this is still stuck in some bureaucracy in the US. Yeah. What structural changes are required uh, on the government regulatory on the government side and the regulatory bodies to speed this up? It looks like government lacks the capability to handle such technical topics and proposals. And um, yeah, so this viewer has exactly put his finger on what I think a lot of us feel feel and fear about the US regulatory uh, capacity. Yeah, I think that's that's that, that that's right. Um, I, I agree. I think um, I, I would make the same. I think the same challenge is present in Europe, although in not not so much in autos. Because I think autos, um, I think there's, you know, my my sense at least, and, and this the 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 questioner would know better than me. Um, my sense is that there's a lot closer um, integration um, uh, with 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 regulators. There, it, it is, you know. You know, coming back to this this challenge that the U.S. has, um, where you know regulatory culture is is weak, under resourced, its legitimacy is under constant attack. You know, it's meant that it's meant at least two things. One is that regulators tend to be under resourced. They don't they don't have the capacity they need to, I think, keep up. I'm speaking in broad brushstrokes. But I think this is true of, of, of NHTSA, the US um, regulator for, for, auto, for auto safety. They struggle to keep up with new technologies just because they, they just don't have the, they get pulled in so many different directions. Uh, but second is, you know, if, if political culture makes regulators seem backwards and their legitimacy is in constant question, gosh, it's really hard to recruit people to come work for you, right? Um, and so part, part of it, I think, you know, is, is, is um, you know, reinvigorating um, with appropriate, you know, guardrails for overreach, um, sort of US regulatory culture, uh, more practically, you know, uh, I mean, I could go deeper into the sort of the, the interagency weeds here, but um, I, I think, you know, that there's an organization within the Office of Management and Budget um, you know, uh, it's called OIRA, and I'm, I'm my 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 coffee's worn off, and I'm going to butcher what that acronym actually stands for. Um, but basically, it's it's the organization within OMB, which sits within the White House, by the way, that coordinates um, regulatory policy. And um, you know, OIRA, it it has the potential and has been a very strong player in regulatory policy when the president and his or her team want it to be. Um, under the Trump administration, um, OIRA's mission was to cut regulation, full stop. Um, in OIRA, that's given a different mission. Maybe it's, you know, um, you know, equipping the federal regulatory apparatus for the twenty first for twenty first century risks. Could take a very different approach and help, um, you know both identify and uh, work out solutions to some of the, the barriers that, 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 you know, taking autos as an example that, 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 that the, the questioner pointed to. So, um, you know, NHTSA, um, I think is, is um, like many organizations, regulatory organizations, it's understaffed. Um, it struggled to, you know, keep up with um, 
technology trends. Um, I don't mean that as an insult to the people who are there. Uh, they, the people that are there are overworked, underpaid, in my opinion. Um, but it is just a fact. Um, and, um, and that has to change, I think, if, if we're yeah. to keep it. So um, I, I think we can uh, broadly agree that uh, in the United States, we don't yet have a culture in which children say to their parents, mommy, I want to grow up to be a regulator. Um, <laughs> and that is uh, one of the big challenges we face. We've gone on, I think, a little past the witching hour already. There are a million more questions. And, uh, uh, and you've opened up uh, you know, the door to um, uh, an awful lot of uh, issues that need to be dealt with. So I hope we can circle back and answer more of them, or at least contemplate more of them uh, in the not too distant future. But I really want to thank you for um, uh, you know, a fascinating uh, drive into uh, the future of the automobile and the future of regulation. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, those of our audience who are still with us. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed it, and I hope you will join uh, again uh, in our upcoming online events. And um, we're certainly looking forward to resuming in-person events uh, this fall. Uh, please do uh, have a look at our website, uh, uh, www.americanacademy.de for upcoming uh, events. Um, I know that the last one of uh, our season will be entitled in German Schreiben von Unterwegs, Postkarten von Walter Benjamin. So uh, notes from uh, along the road, postcards from uh, the philosopher and literary critic Walter Benjamin with Liliana Weisberg. That will be on July 5th um, as part of our Lisa and Heinrich Arnold lecture series. Um, and that will be in coordination with the Dresden Art museums. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll have one more that we'll, you'll be hearing about in the newsletter and will be online soon. And um, again, I want to thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank you, Andy. And uh, I look forward to discussing these issues more in the future. And um, I have to say, looking at your backdrop, um, uh, well, enjoy California and another <laughs> beautiful day, even though I know that's uh, artificial. Somehow I imagine it's not too far off. <laughs> so do take care. It's been care great to be here. Thanks, Dan. Us.